Lesson 1A.6, Rate of Change. So throughout our previous algebra classes, we have learned that the concept of slope is about measuring the rate of change of a line. If I look at a line, the rate of change of that line is a constant number, rise over run, no matter where I measure that rate of change or over what length of interval I measure that rate of change, the rate of change will always be a constant. We measure the slope of a line using rise over run. Now, a more formal way to say that would be delta y over delta x. This is the Greek letter delta. This is not a triangle. Delta y over delta x. Anytime I see that Greek letter delta in math or science, that means change. So the change in y represents rise. The change in x represents run. We can calculate change by simply subtracting the second number minus the first number, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This is how we write things in algebra 1. But as we mature, as we grow up, as we enter higher level math classes, we tend to formalize the notation. This is still perfectly fine. This is still perfectly fine. I want you to be aware that I'm typically going to write rate of change like this, f of b minus f of a over b minus a where a and b represent x values, b is greater than a, and then f of a would be the y value that corresponds to a, f of b would be the y value that corresponds to b. So instead of saying y2 minus y1, I'm going to say f of b minus f of a. Instead of saying x2 minus x1, I'm going to say b minus a. Both of these formulas say the same thing. This is just a little bit more formal of language using function notation. Now, the issue I'm going to be presented with in this class is how do I calculate slope when I'm looking at a graph that is not a line? Here we have a curve. Here we have another curve. Now, be aware, I'm often going to refer to lines as curves as well. All three of these would be referred to as curves, except the line is a curve that doesn't curve. So it has zero curve. Well, having zero money is still a, uh, an amount of money, zero. So this is zero curve, this is curve, this is curve. So all of these I'm going to collectively refer to as curves. This curve just happens to be a line. Now we can measure the slope of a line using our slope formula, but the slope of a curve needs a little bit more explanation because a curve does not have slope. A line has a constant rate of change. We have a constant, constant rate of change versus for the actual curves, we have a variable rate of change. The rate of change is constantly changing. As I travel upward, I'm traveling upward really quickly, and then I start to slow down. Here, I'm traveling upward really slowly, and then I start to speed up. So the rate of change is changing on actually curved curves. So the way we're going to describe the rate of change on a curve is by using something called average rate of change. Consider I have a curve, all right? This curve happens to be increasing. This curve happens to be concave up. I just drew a curve at random. Now, what I did is I picked two points on that curve, this point and this point, and I connected those two points with a line. That line is called a secant line. A secant line has two intersections with the curve. A line that intersects a curve in two locations is called a secant line. Secant sounds like second. Second reminds me of the number two. So two intersection points is called a secant line. Now, I can measure the slope of a line. The slope of a line is easy. Rise over run, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Slope of a line is easy to measure. The slope of a curve is harder to measure. So instead, what I can do is between those, these two points, I can simply argue that the slope of the secant line between those two curves represents the average rate of change of the curve over that given interval. So if I'm looking for average rate of change, just use our algebra one slope formula, f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. Anytime I'm looking for average rate of change, just use the algebra one slope formula between those two points and the slope of the secant line represents the average slope of the curve between those two points. Now, if I wanted to know the slope at each individual point, that would be a different question. 
move these two points closer together until they're right on top of each other, and you have a line that looks like this. This line only touches the curve in one location. We call this a tangent line, one intersection. The slope of the tangent line is the instantaneous rate of change of the curve. This would be the slope of the curve at a single point. Average rate of change is the slope of the secant line, the average slope over that interval. Instantaneous rate of change is the slope at that exact point. Here I have a secant line where I have two intersection points. So I pick two points, I measure the rise, I measure the run. The average slope, which is this number right here, the average slope over the course of that interval is represented by the secant line. The slope of the secant line is the average rate of change. But if I take this point and put it on top of this point, eventually I have a problem where the rise is zero, the run is zero, and the slope itself would be undefined. So in order to get the slope at a single point, that's where we use the tangent line. The tangent line maps the slope to the curve over the entire interval. I can move the point back and forth. Here we have a negative slope. Here we have a positive slope. The tangent line represents the slope at that point. Now the problem is calculating the slope of that tangent line requires more advanced techniques. Take a calculus class. I'll tell you all about calculating the slope of a tangent line. This is pre-calculus, so we're going to be focusing on slope of the secant line. So consider if the curve is increasing, notice that no matter where I put this point, if the curve is increasing, the tangent line is always increasing as well. The slope of the tangent line is always positive when the curve is increasing. When the curve is decreasing, when the curve is decreasing, the tangent line is always pointed down. When the curve is decreasing, the slope is negative. Now, of course, where it changes from negative to positive, that would be my minimum, which is where the uh, slope is zero. So if I look at this chart, notice graph going up. At T1, the function is increasing, so the rate of change is positive. At T3, the graph is decreasing, so where the function is decreasing, the rate of change is negative. Right here, T2 represents a maximum, but it would also be true at this point right here at a minimum. Whether you're at a maximum or a minimum, imagine a slope at either of those points, the slope will be zero. So let's practice calculating the average rate of change over the interval zero to four. Here are three different examples that we're going to look at. Throughout this course, we're going to follow something called the rule of four. The rule of four says that for any concept, we're going to approach that question four different ways. Algebraically, numerically, graphically, and verbally. Every single concept, we should be able to address it four different ways. Algebraically, using algebraic formula. Numerically, would be like using a table. Graphically, using a graph. And verbally just means we can talk about it, we can explain our reasoning, we can justify by explaining the topic based on definitions and properties and all that. All right, so let's look at the first one first. Average rate of change, okay. Average rate of change. If I want to calculate average rate of change, that's f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. a and b is the interval on which we are traveling. So we're going from 0 to 4. So it would be 4 minus 0. Up here would be f of 4. Right here would be f of 0. So average rate of change on the interval 0 to 4 is really f of 4 minus f of 0 over 4 minus 0. Let's evaluate f of 4. 4 times 3 is 12. 12 plus 4 is 16. The square root of 16 is 4. f of 0. Plug in 0. 0 times 3 is 0. 0 plus 4 is 4. Square root of 4 is 2 over 4 minus 0. So that would be 2 over 4 or 1 half. Final answer. Second question. Same uh, idea. Average rate of change. We're going to use the same formula. f of 4 minus f of 0 all over 4 minus 0. Keep in mind, though, the name of this function is not f, it's k. So let's say instead of f, let's label it properly, k of 4 minus k of 0 equal uh, over 4 minus 0. 
So k of 4 is 5. k of 0 is 6 over 4 minus 0. So that will be negative 1 over 4, final answer. And the third one, we're going to do average rate of change over the interval 0 to 4. So uh, that'll be f of 4 minus f of 0 over 4 minus 0. This graph doesn't have a name to it, so f is perfectly fine as a placeholder. f of 4 is right here. That's going to be 1 minus f of 0, which is right here. That's going to be 3 over 4 minus 0. So we get negative 2 over 4 or negative 1 half. Final answer. Now keep in mind when we have a graph and I'm asking for average rate of change, average rate of change again just means slope. So if I'm looking for a slope between two points on a graph, I can literally just measure rise over run. So down 2, run 4. So my slope is negative 2 over 4 or negative 1 half. It's unnecessary to do all this work if you could just look at the graph and identify the rise over run. Average rate of change just means slope of the secant line. Now, notice I'm going from height of 3 to a height of 1. Also keep in mind that the answer should be negative. If you have a function that's decreasing, the slope should be negative. All right, over the next few slides, we're going to look at some graphs and essentially just list slopes in order, uh, either from least to greatest or greatest to least. So feel free to pause uh, on each of these questions. Hit play when you're ready. So I'm going to list the rates of change of f at the three label points, a, b, and c, in order from least to greatest. Now, I don't actually have to calculate any slopes. I just need to know which one's the least, which one's the greatest. At point a, notice that we're on the increasing portion of the graph. If the function is increasing, that means the rate of change is positive. So what I know is that the slope of a is positive. I'm not going to attempt to calculate what it actually is. I just know that it's positive. I notice that B is on the decreasing portion of the graph. If it's decreasing, then that means the rate of change should be negative. So the slope is negative. And then C is at a minimum. Well, if it's at a minimum, then that means the slope at C would be zero. We need to list from least to greatest. So that would make the negative number the least and the positive number the greatest. So that would be my answer. On which interval is the rate of change the greatest? Okay, so let's look at each one of these intervals, starting with two to three. So two is right here, three is right here. The uh, rate of change can be calculated by the secant line. From 2 to 3, that secant line is 0, so I'm just going to put a 0 there to remind myself that this one had a slope of 0. From 3 to 5 is right here. We have a negative slope there, so I'm going to say less than 0. From 5 to 7, here's 5. 7 is about right here. We have a positive slope there, so I'm going to say greater than 0. And then from 7 to 8, from 7 to 8, it's about right here. Once again, we have a negative slope. And since we're looking for the greatest, our greatest slope would be the only one that is positive. Same question, but now I want the least slope. So if I just go back for a second, I'm looking for, again, the least slope. With the least slope, I'm going to look at the negative slopes. This one right here and this one right here. Now, larger and smaller, I'm looking for the relative size of those slopes. This slope is negative, this slope is negative, but as we can see, this slope is steeper than this slope. A slope that's closer to horizontal is gonna be closer to zero. A slope that's closer to vertical is gonna be a larger magnitude of number. It's not larger positive, it's larger in magnitude. So this slope, the purple slope, because it's steeper, is a smaller number or a less number than this number right here. This one would be more negative than this one. So our answer on this question will be D. Now, like I said, we need to approach problems four different ways, algebraically, numerically, graphically, and verbally. Here's an example of a verbal 
question. The graph of the function y equals f of x in the xy plane always has a negative rate of change. Which of the following definitions for the variables x and y would best model the function f? Pause here, go ahead and read through the answer choices so you can come up with an answer, and then play when you're ready. So the key is that I'm looking for a negative rate of change. If I'm looking for a negative rate of change, that's the same thing as a decreasing function. And when I'm deciding whether a function is decreasing or increasing, it is the outputs that I'm focusing my attention on. X will always increase, the inputs will always increase. The question is, what are the outputs doing as the inputs increase? For example, X is the age and years of a young child. So as the age increases, the height of the young child, hopefully, will increase as well. I'm looking for decrease, so that's not the answer. As the total number of points scored in a basketball game increase, the time remaining in seconds in the game, well, as the total number of points is increasing, that means the game is progressing. Well, since there's a set time as to when the game will end, the time remaining in the game will decrease. So we have our winner. Let's just double check the others. As the time in seconds since a ball was thrown straight up in the air increases. So the time after we throw the ball straight up in the air. Keep in mind, if I throw the ball straight up in the air, it's going to go up and then it's going to come back down. So it's going to increase and then it's going to decrease. So if it increases and then it decreases, the height increases and then decreases. It does decrease eventually, but the question specifically said the word always, so that one's out. The radius in meters uh, of a circle, so if the radius increased, the area would also increase. So that one's out as well. So B is confirmed to be the correct answer. More graphs at which label point is the rate of change the least? Pause here, play when you're ready. So again, we're looking for the least rate of change. So this one, I have a positive slope. This one, I have a positive slope. This one, I have a negative slope. This one, I have a negative slope. But once again, I have, I'm looking for the least, I have a negative slope here and I have a negative slope here. The question is, which one is more negative? Well, if I compare this slope to this slope, the slope at D is steeper than the slope at C. So D would be the correct answer. Now with this one, we can actually take a closer examination as to what's happening. Because what I notice is that the curve is concave up over here and concave down over here. Now, since it was at one point concave up and at one point concave down, that means there exists a point where we had a change in concavity. By observation, I have that point right here. We call that a point of inflection. So point B is my point of inflection. It's concave up to the left, it's concave down to the right. Now, when a curve is concave up, if I pick any two points on that curve and measure the slope, pick two points on the curve, measure the slope, pick two points on the curve, measure the slope, pick two points on the curve, measure the slope, pick two points on the curve, measure the slope. What I have is a situation, well, here's the slope right here. Notice that the slope right there is a little bit steeper. So this slope is going to be steeper than this one, but it's steeper in the negative direction. So this slope is negative. This slope is also negative, but this one is more negative than this one. This slope right here looks to be zero. So we're going more negative, slightly less negative, zero. This one's positive and then this one's more positive. So what's happening, we have more negative, negative, zero, positive, more positive. As we travel around the concave up curve, the slopes are increasing in size. The slopes are always increasing. For a concave down curve, pick two points, pick two points, pick two points, pick two points, pick two points. So here we have a positive slope. This one is slightly less positive. So this one is more positive. This one looks zero. This is negative. This is going to be more negative. If you have a concave down curve, positive, positive, zero, negative, 
more negative, these slopes are decreasing. So if I look at this question, at point C, I have a negative slope. At point D, I also have a negative slope. But the curve is concave down, which means as I travel from left to right, the slopes are decreasing. Therefore, this slope must be smaller than this slope. Let's formalize that. If a curve is concave up, the rate of change is increasing. If a curve is concave down, the rate of change is decreasing. Now, at this point, we have a lot of increasing and decreasing and positives and negatives, so I want to build you a chart to help you keep everything straight. Consider a function. A function can be positive. If the function is above the x-axis, the function is positive. If the function is below the x-axis, the function is negative. A function can also be increasing. A function going up is increasing. A function going down is decreasing. Now keep in mind that a function can be both positive and decreasing at the same time. A function being positive and negative or increasing versus decreasing, those are different characteristics of the function. A function above the x-axis can be going up. A function above the x-axis can be going down. A function cannot be both positive and negative at the same time, but it can be positive and increasing at the same time. It can be negative and increasing at the same time. Characteristics of positive and negative are different from characteristics of increasing and decreasing. Likewise, a function can be concave up, a function can be concave down. It can't be concave up and concave down at the same time, but a graph can be concave down and positive at the same time. A graph can be concave down and increasing at the same time. A graph can be negative, increasing, a graph can be negative, increasing, and concave up at the same time. They're different characteristics of the graph. Now, we also recently talked about if a function is increasing, its rate of change is positive. A function that's going upward has a positive slope. A function that is decreasing has a negative slope. It is crucially important that we never use the word it to identify a function or a graph. Because which function are you talking about? Are you talking about the original function? Or are you talking about the rate of change of the function? When you say a phrase like, it is positive, well, are you talking about the function being positive, meaning it's above the x-axis? Or are you talking about the rate of change being positive, meaning that the function is actually increasing? Because a function increasing need not be above the x-axis. Always identify what function we're talking about, function or rate of change, before you identify the behavior. A function can be increasing and positive. A function can be increasing and negative. Therefore, a function can be negative and its rate of change be positive at the same time. Similarly, we have concavity means that the rate of change is increasing. Concave down means the rate of change is decreasing. A function can be concave up and negative meaning that the function is negative, but the rate of change is increasing. That's perfectly fine. They're different characteristics that are describing different aspects of the curve. But just like when a function can be increasing and its rate is positive, the function, any function that is increasing, has a rate of change that is positive. Well, a rate of change is a type of function. So if the rate of change is increasing, then that means it's rate of the rate of change would be positive. Given a function, you can measure its rate of change. Well, you can also take the rate of change and measure its rate of change. The rate of change of the rate of change is also something we're going to explore. So if the rate of change is increasing, then the rate of the rate of change would be positive. Likewise, if the rate of change is decreasing, then the rate of the rate of change would be negative. So we have three tiers of behavior between the three different characteristics of uh, the function. We have concave up, increasing, and positive. We have concave down, decreasing, and negative. Those relationships will always hold true. Let's look at a couple more examples. Go ahead and pause here. Look at this one. Play when you're ready. So we want to order the following from least to greatest. So let's look at each one in turn. All of these are rates of change. Some of them are average. Some of them are instantaneous. So an average rate of change is represented by a secant line from 0 to 3.5. Here's 0, 3.5 would be right here. 
my secant line is increasing, so I'm going to mark that as positive, meaning the average rate of change would be positive. Here we have an instantaneous rate of change, which I don't know how to calculate, but at x equals 1, I notice, oh, that's a maximum. So the tangent line is horizontal, so the slope is 0. Average rate of change from 1 to 3, from 1 to 3, that one's going to be negative. And the instantaneous rate of change at 0.5, somewhere around here, drawing a tangent line, that's going to be positive, but that positive is definitely going to be more positive than this positive. So that one would be the greatest. And then this would be the least. 3, 2, 1, 4 in that order. Here's another question. Pause here. Play when you're ready. All right. This one may have seemed intimidating at first, but we're going to break this down piece by piece to understand how simple this actually was. So I'm looking at the rate, uh, the uh, where is the function increasing at an increasing rate? We've got increasing at an increasing rate, increasing at a decreasing rate, decreasing at an increasing rate, decreasing at a decreasing rate. That sounds like a mouthful, but if you break it down piece by piece, it's a pretty simple concept. Notice this phrase can be broken into two parts. Where is it increasing? And then where is the rate increasing? The graph itself would be increasing from here to here and from here to here. So that leaves A and H as candidates for the correct answer. But then it also says increasing rates. As we talked about a moment ago, if the rate is increasing, then the graph is concave up. So graph is concave down on this part of the function, graph is concave up on this part of the function. So that means increasing at an increasing rate would be h. When I see the phrase increasing rate, I can literally just replace that with concave up. Increasing at an increasing rate is the same thing as saying increasing and concave up. So h is increasing and it's on an interval that is concave up. So if you were stuck and now you understand, feel free to pause here and finish the rest, or let's keep going. So increasing at a decreasing rate, decreasing rate really means concave down. So still increasing, but now concave down, that's going to be point A. Decreasing at an increasing rate, increasing rate really means concave up. So decreasing and concave up, so decreasing is going to be this portion of the graph right here and concave up, concave up is on this portion of the graph, that's going to be point E. Decreasing at a decreasing rate, that's going to be point C, because it's decreasing and concave down. The rate of change is positive, that's just a fancy way of saying increasing. We already said that it was increasing for both A and H. The rate of change of the rate of change is positive. That's a fancy way of saying concave up. Concave up was this portion of the graph right here. So that's going to include E. Let's not forget about F and H. E, F, H. All right. So we just went through some graphical representations of rate of change. Uh, now let's focus on tabular or numerical focus on rate of change. Now, what we have here is a table of values. I want to know where the function is increasing and decreasing. I want to know where the function is concave up, concave down. When I have a graph, I can simply look at it, see where the graph is going up, that's increasing. Where is the graph going down? That's decreasing. I can also do something similar here. I'm going from 4 to 1 to 4 to 13 to 28 to 49. Increasing and decreasing is a question about outputs. Clearly, the outputs are decreasing first and then increasing the rest of the way. So increasing from 0 to 4, decreasing from negative 1 to 0. Remember, we're looking at x values when we're describing intervals of increasing and decreasing. Keep in mind, the question says justify your answer. Well, since I just looked at the outputs to determine the answer, I could simply say, because the outputs of f are increasing, and then likewise, I can say the outputs of f are decreasing. Perfectly legitimate answer. The definition of increasing from day one of, of pre-calculus was that if the outputs are increasing, 
the function is increasing. If the outputs are decreasing, then the function is decreasing. That's exactly what's happening here, so that's how I justified my answer. Although, I could justify that answer a different way, because we talked about a moment ago that an increasing function means that the rate of change is positive. A decreasing function, the rate of change is negative. If we explore the rates of change, I can see the same answer a different way. Notice from 4 to 1, we're decreasing by 3, but remember rate of change is rise over run, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, so I would need to do 0 minus negative 1, we just have a dis difference of 1 right there, so the slope is just negative 3. So from negative 1 to 0, the rate of change is negative, So from negative 1 to 0, the rate of change is negative, so I could have said that it was decreasing because the rate of change is negative. Same here, if I measure that slope, that slope, that slope, and that slope, from 1 to 4, that would be 3 over 1. This would be 6 over 1. Nope, that would be 9 over 1. This one would be 15 over 1. And this one would be 21 over 1. All the slopes from, from x equals 0 to x equals 4 are positive. So the rate of change is positive. So either justification is fine. You could either say increasing because the outputs are increasing, or you could say increasing because the rate of change is positive. Both are true statements. Both are legal statements. Now, for concavity, it's not about the rate of change being positive or negative, it's increasing or decreasing. If I look at each of these rates, I can see we're going from negative 3 to 3 to 9 to 15 to 21. Those rates of change are increasing. Now, they're always increasing, negative 3 to 3 to 9 to 15 to 21. They never decrease. They're only increasing. So for concavity, I can go ahead and say that we have a concave up from negative 1 to 4 because the rate of change is increasing. I could also remember rate of change is increasing would be the same thing as the rate of the rate of change is positive. If I wanted to, I could have explored the slope of the slopes using the same technique. From negative 3 to 3, I'm adding 6. From 3 to 9, I'm adding 6 again. From 9 to 15, I'm adding 6. From 15 to 21, I'm adding 6. All of those numbers are positive, so I have the rate of the rate of change is positive. This explanation and this explanation say the same thing. You don't need to say both. One or the other is fine. Now, the fact that there was 6 all the way across, that actually gives us some other interesting information. Because uh, when I'm doing this technique, when I'm uh, figuring out the rate of change of uh, a table of data and then the rate of change of the rate of change, another way to phrase this is the first differences and the second differences. Given a table of data, the first differences represent your average rate of change between each data point. And then the second differences represent your uh, change in average rate of change or the rate, uh, uh, rate of the rate of change. Now, if the first differences the average rate of change was the constant. If you have a graph that's changing at a constant rate, the rate of change is constant. What I'm describing is a line. A line has an average rate of change that is constant. The slope is always the same no matter which pair of points you pick. If the first differences are constant, you have a line. If the first differences are constant, you have a line. If the second differences are constant, like we have here, we can actually conclude that it's a parabola. It's quadratic. Linear, average rate of change is constant. Quadratic, the average rate of change is increasing or decreasing at a constant rate. That's what a quadratic function is, that it's increasing or decreasing at a constant rate. This pattern continues to hold through. True. If you go to the third differences and those are constant, it's cubic, and so on and so forth. Keep in mind, though, this rule is only for polynomials. You would have to know in advance that the data you're looking at can be described as a polynomial. Once you know that, if you look at the first differences, second differences, third differences, and so on, and any of them are constant, whichever index value of differences, if it's the 15th differences that are constant, 
then it's a 15th degree polynomial. So here's another set. Why don't you try this one? Pause here, play when you're ready. So looking at the first differences from negative 20 to negative 4, that's adding 16. So that means the function is increasing, which is exactly what I see here. From negative 4 to 0, we're adding 4, not linear. From 0 to negative 2, we're subtracting 2. And then we're subtracting 2 again. And then we're adding 4. All right, keep in mind, don't just look at the y values. Look at the x values as well. Technically, this is 16 over the difference there, which is just 1, 1, 1, 1. 1. It happened to be 1 this time. It may not be 1 next time. So pay attention to the x's, uh, not just the y's. Second differences. If I do the second differences, 16 to 4, I am subtracting 12. 4 to negative 2, I am subtracting 6. Here I'm subtracting nothing, and then here I'm adding 6. So second differences are not constant, but if I notice, the third difference is add 6, Add 6, add 6. The third differences are constant, so I can actually conclude that this is a cubic function. Where is it increasing? Increasing where the rate of change is positive, so from negative 2 to 0, uh, and how about 2 to 3? Because the rate of change is positive, it is decreasing from 0 to 2 because the rate of change is negative. Where is the graph concave up and concave down? Look at the second differences. I see negative, negative, zero, positive, uh, positive. So zero, it's neither concave up nor concave down. Let's just use one as a placeholder for that location. So I'm gonna say negative two, so it's concave down, from negative two to one, and then it would be concave up from 1 to 3. And that is because the rate of the rate of change is negative. The rate of the rate of change is positive. All right. So a few more similar practice problems. Here are three functions that may represent polynomials. Uh, which would classify each one of these as a linear function, a quadratic function, or an ideal. Pause here, play when you're ready. Looking at the first one, so pay attention to the x values. The x values need to increase at a constant rate in order for this technique to work. If the numbers are all over the place, we kind of have to throw the problem out, um, or at least there's not enough information to answer the question. So we're increasing by one each time over here. Over here, my first difference is I've got three, six to 11, that's gonna be five, 11 to 18, that's gonna be seven. So the first differences are not constant, but the second differences are. So this one is gonna be quadratic. Let's look over here. Notice this time, let's be careful, this time, we are not increasing by 1, but we are increasing still by a at a constant rate. Add 2, add 2, add 2. So as long as the input values are increasing at a constant rate, then we can still use this trick. All right, so from 5 to 2, we're going to be subtracting 3. Here, we're going to be subtracting 3. Here, we're going to be subtracting 3. So we have a constant rate. This one is linear. First differences are constant, linear. All right, now the third one, again, make sure you're looking at the x value, negative 4 to negative 1 to 0 to 1. Now, here we have a problem. Negative 4 to negative 1, we're adding 3, then we're adding 2, then we're adding, well, I'm sorry, then we're adding 1, then we're adding 1. So we have a, a constant between this number and this number, but this number, I don't really care about negative 4. I need this to be negative 2 in order to fit the pattern. I could look at the differences. The problem is I'm going from negative 17 to negative 2, so that's adding 15. From here to here, I'm adding 1. From here to here, I'm subtracting 1. If I look at the next differences, I subtracted 14. Here, I subtracted uh, 2. Uh, and then 
now it just, you know, from negative 14 to negative 2, I added 12. There's no, there's nothing here that's going to help me answer the question. There's not enough information, so I'm just going to go with neither because I can't draw a conclusion from this data. Now, spoiler alert, this data, I built this data based on a quadratic function. H actually is a quadratic function, but the technique failed because the x values were not distributed evenly. So if I uh, you know, got a few more data points, I'd be able to uh, uh, figure out uh, uh, that this was in fact quadratic, but without equal equally distributed data points, there's insufficient information for me to answer that question without knowing some other things about quadratics. All right, here's a similar question. Pause here, play when you're ready. So this time I'm just looking for concave up and concave down. So concave up and concave down is going to have to do with either second differences. Second differences need to be positive. Second differences need to be negative. Or first differences need to be increasing. First differences need to be decreasing. Really doesn't matter which technique you do. Keep in mind this one we already did. It was first differences three, five, seven. Second differences were two and two. So the graph was quadratic. Since the second differences were positive two, this is a quadratic opening up. So is it concave up or concave down? It's concave up. Over here, now notice the uh, x intervals. This one, difference is 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So even though I'm using decimals now, we're still good. The x values are distributed evenly. This is perfectly fine. So let's try it. 1 to 7, we're adding 6. 7 to 11, we are adding 4. 11 to 13, we are adding 2. Notice, first differences are decreasing. Decreasing means concave down. If we were to keep going, that's minus 2 minus 2. Notice that the second differences are constant. This is a quadratic. I didn't ask you that it, whether it was quadratic, but it is. It's concave down because it's negative. It's a quadratic opening down. One more set of questions. Now, these last two questions, I actually pulled the wording from the AP exam. This on the AP exam will be uh, free response question 2, part B1, and possibly part B2, depending on how they ask the question. Uh, each year. But this is exactly what it's going to look like on your AP exam. Use the given data to find the average rate of change from x equals 1 to x equals 5. Then use the average rate of change to estimate f of 10. So here's something we're going to be doing throughout the year. Use some data to come up with a, uh, uh, a pattern. Once we know that pattern, we can use that pattern to make a prediction about what's going to happen in the future. Now because it's, it's explicitly telling me to use average rate of change, that's what I'm going to do, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. It's crucial on the AP exam that you show the work that supports your answer. The question says, use the given data to find the average rate of change, which means if you don't show how you got that average rate of change, I don't know that you use data. You show the work that supports your answer, show me the setup before answering the question. So f of 5, well, there's a coordinate at 5, 2, so f of 5 is 2. F of 1, there's a coordinate at 1, negative 10, so F of 1 is negative 10 over 5 minus 1. So this will be 12 over 4 or 3. The average rate of change is 3. Now, we need to use the average rate of change to estimate F of 10. Keep in mind it's an estimate because the average rate of change is just that, an estimate. It's not the actual rate of change, it's just the average rate of change between two points. This problem, I don't know what the actual curve looks like, but let's say the curve looks like this, and I pick two points on the curve, and then I create a secant line to connect those two points on the curve. Well, if this is 1, and this is 5, and then 10 is way over here, the average rate of change is a line, and I'm going to use that line to make a prediction about where the height of the curve is at 10. I'm clearly going to be wrong, but that's okay, it's just an estimate. So as long as uh, we know we're estimating something, then it's perfectly fine to make a claim about it. So I have two points, and the average rate of change represents the slope of the line. 
what I need to do here is write an equation of a line given a point and a slope. Hopefully you remember how to write an equation of a line. Keep in mind when we're writing equations of lines, there's two main formulas that we're going to use. y equals mx plus b, and y, equal, y minus y1 equals slope x minus x1. y equals mx plus b is a fantastic tool if you know the y-intercept. The y-intercept is the uh, coordinate at x equals 0. I do not know the coordinate at x equals 0. I don't like using y equals mx plus b unless I already know the y-intercept. Point slope is a formula for a line that works for any point in any slope. Well, I have two points and I have a slope. So I'm going to use the slope and plug in three. And then for x1, y1, it really doesn't matter which point I use. I am going to use any, any, I guess I'm using that one, 5, 2. So I'm going to use 5, 2. So y, oops. I'm going to use y minus 2 equals 3x minus 5. So the secant line that goes through these two points with this slope is this equation right here. All right. So now keep in mind y is just a fancy way of saying f of x. So now I want to predict what's going to happen with the y value when x equals 10. So let's go ahead and plug in 10 for x. So 10 minus 5 is 5. 3 times 5 is 15. So y equals 17. In other words, f of 10 is going to be approximately 17. Remember, it's not uh, uh, the original function is not the same as the average rate of change. So that's why I'm saying f of 10 is not equal to 17. f of 10 is estimated to be 17, so approximately 17. I've used data to build a model, and then I use that model to make a prediction. This is what we're going to be doing over and over and over this year. Let's try it again. Use the given data to find the average rate of change from 1 to 5. Use the average rate of change to estimate g of 53. Pause here, play when you're ready. Hopefully you recognize that this is a problem that we've already seen. If I go back a couple of slides, that was this guy right here. We already know that the graph was linear because the first differences were constant, but hopefully you recognize that negative 3 was not the slope. The slope requires rise over run. Now, I'm going from 1 to 5. So I could uh, go from here to here. But keep in mind, because it's linear, it actually didn't matter which points you picked. You could pick these two points. You could pick these two points. It's going to be the same no matter what. The difference here is negative 3. The difference here is positive 2. The slope is negative 3 over 2 no matter which two points you picked. So now, g of 53, let's build an equation. So it'll be y minus, it doesn't matter which point you pick. I'm just going to pick 1, 5 as the coordinate. So y minus 5 equals negative 3 halves, x minus 1. I'm plugging in 53. So 53 for x. No calculators. You don't need a calculator for this. 53 minus 1 is going to be 52. Now, when I'm multiplying 52 times 3 halves, that's the same thing as multiplying by 3 and then dividing by 2, or dividing by 2 and then multiplying by 3. It's the same thing. 52 divided by 2, half of 52, that's 26. And then 26 times 3, what I'm going to do is think about it as 25 times 3 is 75. 3 quarters is 75. But it's another uh, 25 is 1 less than 6, so I need to add 3 more. So that would be 78. Negative 78. So y minus 5 equals negative 78. If I add 5 to negative 78, that's going to be negative 73. So g of 53 would be approximately, because it's an estimate, negative 78.